So welcome to episode two of Planning Shorts. And this episode deals with the question, is the planning system right for reform? I'm Thea Osmond smith I'm a barrister at number five chambers specialising in planning and environmental law. Please do use the chat function uh, or the question uh, and answer function to say hello, uh, debate among yourselves and ask questions. We're very keen to hear your views as well. Now, as much as we like to be original here at Shorts, we're not the only ones talking about this issue and later in the episode we're going to be looking at the essays published by Policy Exchange earlier this month, month featuring of course uh, Bridget Rosewell among others. Now I apologise in advance to the authors of those essays because we can only touch very briefly on them in this webinar. We've got half an hour so we'll do our best but of course they are worth a full read and uh, I'll put the link in the chat uh, in a little while so that you can go and download them if you haven't read them already. Now this isn't just a thought experiment. Robert, Robert Jenrick has said that it is time to rethink planning from first principles and he's not the only one criticising the poor planning system this week. Dominic Cummings apparently thinks the system is appalling and I will leave it to you uh, to consider what other activities that adjective might apply to. Now, I'm going to allow the panel to introduce themselves, um, but can I also ask you this, uh, panellists, that when you introduce yourselves, you answer the question, what are you most looking forward to after lockdown? Killian. Uh, hi Thea, so my name's Killian Garvey. I'm a barrister at King's Chambers. I should probably say, uh, in case my mum and dad ever see it, probably giving them a hug, um, or, or perhaps going to a restaurant with my partner. Thanks, Tora. Uh, hi, I'm Victoria Hutton from Thurston and Essex Chambers. I am most looking forward to uh, childcare. Matthew. Hello everybody, I'm Matthew Fraser, I'm a barrister at Landmark Chambers um, and I'm most looking forward to going and seeing some live music. Ah, oh, yeah, I miss the Isle of Wight Festival, I'm absolutely excited about that, but next year maybe. And Ashley? Uh, hi, good evening everybody, I'm Ashley Bowes, I'm a barrister at Cornerstone, specialising in planning. And I'm certainly most looking forward to having a haircut. <laughs> it's already booked. Oh, already booked. <laughs> you and Chris Young both, I think. Um, but anyway, Dr. Bowes, it is uh, your second week at Inquiry this week, and we're dying to know how you're getting on with your virtual inquiry. Can you please tell us the good, bad and the ugly? Uh, I can. I'll be delighted. I'm going to be rather sad next week that this standing feature won't be here. Um, mm -hmm. But I can say it's still going well. Um, but the, the two things that have been quite entertaining this week, first of all, we've had landscape evidence as a topic and um, pointing out where things are on maps and where exactly people mean, even by sharing the screen, has been quite difficult. So that's something where we've certainly seen um, it would have been better if we'd have all been in the room. And I think, think the evidence could have been chopped through a bit quicker there. And then there was a lovely moment with my planning witness today when she was giving her evidence and she was full flow making a, a, a contentious point and responding to to some uh, effective cross-examination from my opponent to my mate. <laughs> so that, um, and then she had a delivery that she had to take. So it, it kind of cut her off <laughs> flow as she had to go and attend to DHL uh, halfway through. But it's still working and we're still going through it. And actually we're, we're gonna be slightly ahead of schedule, I think, in, um, in closing on Thursday. So uh, good news all around. Excellent. Ashley, can I just ask, um, how have you been finding cross-examination? I mean, if you've been able to read the witness effectively, uh, do you know, as effectively I, as normal. I, I was quite anxious about that, but it, it's, it's reminded me of what my, um, my cousins who are BA pilots have had to say when they go and have to do their simulator training every couple of weeks or so, that when you're in there for the first 10 minutes, it's, it's unusual. But after that, and there's a back and forth of questions and you're referring to documents and everyone knows where everything is, there's no difference at all. And the interaction generally works, generally works absolutely fine. Great. Well, thank you both for that. So uh, obviously we're looking at whether the planning system is ripe for reform, but before we do uh, that, and before we say what we think about that, we want to ask the listeners what they think about it. So fingers uh, on the mouse, get ready. Um, it's this week's poll. What part of the planning system is most in need of planning reform? So hopefully that poll has come up uh, for listeners to view. Can the panellists see it? Uh, not yet, no. <laughs> right, let's, let's try that. I've got Can it. You, you got it out, good. So I'll give that, uh, I don't know, say 10 or 15 seconds. So if everyone can get voting, gosh, 
Greenbelt was an early leader. Plan making Greenbelt. I'm going to write down the results of this actually. It's really unfair we can't vote. <laughs> it is, isn't it? Well, you get, you get a chance to have your say in a moment. Okay. <laughs> okay, right, I'm going to end the poll um, and hopefully this will show everyone what the results are. Oh, plan making uh, wins not quite by a country mile, but by, I would say, some significant way uh, with Greenbelt coming in next. Guys, can you see all the results? Not yet. Not yet. You can't see them. Okay, let's do that. Oh, no, we've got them. Yeah. Oh, you can see them now. Okay. Yeah, so we can see plan, plan making is, is actually in the front with Greenbelt closely behind uh, the whole system. <laughs> <That's a sad laughs> sad indictment right there of the planning system. Dominic uh, Cummings, I think that is. <laughs> <laughs> the Dominic Cummings. Yeah. And, and planning enforcement, registering on the radar, but, but not so important as, as issues of plan making. OK, well, let's uh, have a look then at what the panel think. Please, Matthew, starting with you. I've got a real thing about, um, I don't know about anyone else, I've got a real thing about local planning authorities um, trying to circumvent the, the system for independent examination of plans by publishing documents which purport to be something other than planning policy, when they obviously are planning policy. Um, you'll have all seen documents like this, um, lots of local authorities like them. Um, a lot of them are called things like local development frameworks. Um, I think they should all just be abolished. Um, many of them are probably unlawful because they flout regulation five of the 2012 local planning regulations. And while you're at it, I think you should also abolish or at least significantly amend that regulation because it makes no sense. And actually this was picked up by one of the judges who's considered that regulation recently, Mr. Justice Jay, who said, anomalies pop up like the heads of Hydra however these regulations are construed. Thank you. Killian, anything else from Greek mythology from you? <laughs> <laughs> Not from Greek mythology. I'll try my best to work it in, but um, I don't really have an agenda with planning. Uh, there are plenty of things that I would change if I were the king, a supreme leader, or, or Zeus. <laughs> um, but happily for all of you, I'm not. Um, I'm simply a humble barrister, and I'm largely content to work within the confines of whatever system is in place. Saying that where I get frustrated is where the system is unclear uh, as to how it's meant to work. And where this is most on display for me is planning enforcement. Uh, it's without question the most complicated and convoluted area of planning enforcement law, in my opinion. Um, you don't really need to look far in order to find huge pitfalls where the law is either non-existent, contradictory or just unworkable, and where the consequences for planning enforcement can be grave for some individuals with the potential even for criminal sanctions, I think it ought to be clearer and less complex. Yeah, and actually maybe uh, during the course of this series of episodes, we'll have a, a result from our virtual High Court case yes. against each other that dealt with enforcement and, and was just one of those circumstances where it was complex and where there's uh, competing and, and different judgments on the issue. So thanks for that. Ashley. Uh, thank you. I agree, incidentally, with the previous two speakers. I have to associate myself with what they've said. Um, in, in the tenor of parliamentary debate into which we're entering. But I, I would, um, I, I, my top thing for reform would be the use classes order. Um, we're, we're a very different country. The way we use land and our economy is very different to 1987. Obviously, some things stay the same, but, but there are increasing anomalies which really do need rationalisation. Um, we've overhauled the GPDO uh, a number of times, we've overhauled the development management procedure order a number of times since then. And uh, for example, Airbnb, uh, extra care facilities, whether they fall within C2, C3, are they sui generis, are they some kind of a leisure accommodation, all of those sorts of things, uh, I think needs careful looking at and, and re-examination. Uh, so that would be my suggested reform. Okay, thanks. And Tora? Uh, thanks, Thea. I would choose a duty to cooperate, which is obviously not controversial because I haven't met anyone who likes it. Um, <laughs> for me, the very clear problem is that it's got uh, all the teeth in that it can scupper your plan, but actually it's not that effective. So the, the obvious way to deal with it would be just scrap it and bring back some strategic planning, which a number of people have suggested. But if you couldn't do that, and the government weren't up for it, what I would do is I would, um, I would file off its teeth a bit. So I would 
not uh, make it an issue that scuppers the plan. It would put the authority in the naughty corner, something like that. And then I would look to increasing the effectiveness. And I would therefore bring in potentially mandatory mediation for issues where uh, agreement can't be reached. So you'd have authority A, B and C in a room on an issue such as housing, and cross-border strategic issue, and then you have a mediator brought in, potentially making a binding decision as to where unmet needs should go. Um, and that would have the benefit of everyone being able to blame the mediator um, <laughs> and going back to the voters and saying, well, it's, it's not our fault, we've got an extra thousand houses. So yes. That would be my, my reform. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I have an issue with with the duty to cooperate uh, as well um, in this respect and also with sustainability appraisal. Um, and I think it's about the way in which they're examined once the plan is submitted, because, of course, once the plan is submitted, if those legal duties haven't been complied with, then the plan fails. And the consequences for local planning authorities that have spent years, uh, you know, copious quantities of time and money trying to get a plan together um, to fall at, at the first hurdle seems you know just horribly unfair really so I think there should be a way of examining those issues prior to the submission of the plan um, to at least give a, a preliminary view on whether or not they're met but those are the panel's views uh, let's turn and have a look at what the policy exchange essays have to say um, of course this is a collection of essays by an esteemed group of contributors with proposals ranging from the radical to the slightly less radical, but certainly providing some serious food for thought. Ashley, I think you're going to kick off with uh, Bridget Rosewell's essay, Planning, Who Needs It? Yes, uh, certainly well, well known to viewers, uh, I'm sure, Bridget Rosewell for her, um, for leading the um, review into planning inquiries, and, and indeed I think broadly um, acknowledged to have made some um, well um, uh, and sensible reforms to that system to make them work better and, and that was starting to deliver before obviously the current COVID um, pandemic caused um, delivery to stall. So um, a, a wise and familiar person with the planning system. Nevertheless, with that, that kind introduction out of the way, the, the thesis um, of this is that the plan, the development plan, is a straitjacket, um, a, a shibboleth, uh, a break on the agenda, and the solution that's proposed is to simply do away with the development plan, certainly in its current form. Uh, I, don't, I don't agree with the premise of that. I don't agree with the thesis. In legal terms, the development plan, as we all know, is a legal starting point. It's not an end point. It allows great flexibility for, for people to depart from the plan on a discretionary basis to, to react to, to rapid change. Um, but I also just don't think it's the practical experience of the majority of um, users and participants in the planning system. My inquiry is, is absolutely typical. Of, I'm sure hundreds of inquiries that are going on, which is about a, a proposal outside the settlement limits. Um, we've spent around 30 seconds acknowledging that that's in breach of the development plan. And the rest of the two weeks are spent on really the competing social and environmental um, considerations as to, to where the harms and benefits should fall and how the inspector should exercise her discretion to depart from the plan. So um, I, I don't accept the premise of it, but I do think um, plan making can be reformed. I think that was borne out in the poll that you led, Thea, just then. Um, I think it could be made simpler. Plans could be a lot more high level uh, and they could leave the detail to, to future applications, which of course could then be based on the considerations of the market and other things prevailing at the time. Yeah, I mean, it is radical what's proposed, but then we have a collection of pretty radical uh, proposals here and Robert Adam is also proposing uh, root and branch reform beginning I guess with private property rights and, and, and working from there. How, I mean what's your view of, of his approach? Well as I understand Professor Adam's contribution it's it's almost the complete opposite it's to say that, um, that uh, too much uncertainty and discretion is a problem and that you should correct this by having a rules-based system uh, a zonal code which would prescribe um, what was allowed and what wasn't and if it was in accordance with the code it would just be able to be built and that would be that and if it wasn't then then it couldn't. I think there's two problems with this as well with, with respect to Professor Adam. One, um, it would if you had a one-off legally binding code it would mean that um, people promoting land would fight even harder if it was possible to imagine and even more litigation would follow about the content of the zonal ordinance. I mean, that's, that's inevitable because it'd be one-off and legally binding. And I think the second problem is that unless you 
required it to be updated very, very frequently. Uh, and remember that there's no extra money around to, to fund local planning authorities to do this. Unless you required it to be done, that, then you could have a perverse situation where land is, is not then being zoned for development. Um, and there would be zero discretion to allow uh, a housing scheme, for example, outside the zoned limits, um, because that would not be in accordance with the, the code. And so it could lead to a, a break on development. And I think well, just concluding thought on this is one of the, the, the great things that um, the Centre for Cities, for example, and Professor Adam and all the people who are proposing zones say is that discretion is the problem with the system because discretion allows uh, arbitrary refusal outside what the plan says. But, but I think a lot of those people forget in that debate is that it's also a discretion to say yes on occasions in departure from the plan when considerations occur. And that's why our system, broadly speaking, uh, is quite well respected in Europe because it, it has, allows pragmatism uh, and flexibility, whereas a zonal system, really, you are, you are stuck with that um, unless you can amend it and have the resources to give it up to date. Yeah. Um, well, Tora, carrying on with the theme of zoning, um, you're going to be looking at David Rudlin's essay, or charming account, uh, News from Nowhere, the Future of uh, Planning in Cities. And what do you make of that? Thanks, Thea. Well, if I just sort of explain it first for anyone who hasn't read it, it's a, a narrative form. It reads like something out of H.G. Wells, um, a sort of future. It's painted as a utopia. I wouldn't agree, actually. I think it's sort of bordering on the dystopia of a planning system in 2050 once certain reforms have been brought in. And the broad premise of it is that there is a, a three-tier planning system, uh, the sort of national level, a, a sort of strategic level, which would be city or county, and then the local level. And the headline point is that it would be zonal. So you'd have, say, four zones per local plan, which would be zoned according to the density of development. You would be in certain zone A, B, or C, if you complied with the very detailed rules, for example, on how many meters of development per hectare, uh, you would get permission by rubber stamp from your town hall. And if you um, don't comply, then you don't get permission. So that's sort of the, the premise uh, of the reform. Um, in terms of what I think about it, well, I guess, how long have you got? I mean, I, <laughs> I, I think there's a huge amount to say here, and I'd agree exactly uh, with, with what Ashley has said, and I, I'd make three headline points. One is planning is always going to require a balance between interests, and those will be public and private interests. There'll be things like heritage, ecology, economy, etc. This system won't get around that. You're going to have to have those arguments, although they will be front loaded, and as Ashley says, they're going to be much more hard fought. So you're not going to get rid of the lawyers, which is really what this is aimed at. The, apparently, the, <laughs> The essay says that the lawyers have grown fat. I think we've all grown fat in lockdown. It's not, um, not as a result of the planning system. <laughs> uh, the second point I make is, is exactly the point Ashley made about inflexibility. One of the great things about our planning system is it can respond to changing circumstances, updated technology, or even new innovative design. Um, and uh, I, I worry that this sort of complete computer says no approach uh, would stifle that. And then the third is that this is a hammer to crack a nut. I think we all agree that there are problems, uh, but this is a complete cultural shift. And I, I would encourage people to read the essay because for me, it felt so far from where we are at the moment. It felt so culturally alien that you've got that it would take years, probably decades to put into place. And for that to happen, you need buy-in from everyone because it won't be possible under the term of this government you're going to need some sort of momentum moving forward, and I just don't think that exists. Okay, well, we know that zoning is already happening in a number of countries. We've heard lots of references to Australia, for example, and also France. Should we get some comfort from the fact that it's working elsewhere? I think, look, I, I, I'd have to start the comment by recognising that I'm not an expert in German zoning or whatever goes on in the Netherlands and Japan. But we've, we were discussing this yesterday, as you know, and I'm, I'm gonna rip off an, a, a point that Ashley made, because I think it's, it's a good one, which, um, which was the point that, well, there's no other country that has shifted so far from one system to another. And that's what this would require. Uh, and the fact is, well, maybe there will be a time in the future where it's appropriate, but we've got COVID-19 at the moment. We're in a financial black hole. Um, local authorities are unbelievably underfunded. I just cannot see it working. 
Okay, we've had an interesting comment from Harry White, who worked in uh, Canada as a planning consultant for a sustained period. Um, and he says that the zonal method works extremely uh, well in North America and Canada. I mean, certainly for all of us, um, we might have had an outside awareness of zoning, but it's really come to the forefront. And I, for one, am really interested to know just how it works in, in other countries, both in urban and rural areas. But, so thanks, Harry, for that, um, that contribution. And, and, and maybe you'll have to give us a webinar. In, in just exactly how that works. Um, but Matthew, turning to you, you're going to be looking at affordable housing um, and planning for affordable housing, which is a piece by uh, Jamie Ratcliffe and Reuben Young. What's the, the thesis of that piece? So their thesis, you can kind of summarise it in five, five steps. Uh, the first step is our discretionary planning system. So the same point being made about discretion. Our discretionary planning system creates uncertainty about affordable housing provision. That's the first step. Second step, that uncertainty leads to an assumption being made about inadequate affordable housing provision in viability appraisals for development. Thirdly, the inadequate affordable housing provision pushes up value. And then fourthly, that makes development more expensive. And then finally, making the, the development more expensive in turn justifies a reduced provision of affordable housing. So it's kind of like a vicious cycle or a self-fulfilling prophecy about reduced affordable housing provision. So what's the proposed solution to that problem? They want to get rid of all the discretion and they want to make affordable housing something that developers have to contribute to by way of a non-negotiable flat tax and it's based the tax is effectively based on the prediction of development value that the developer themselves submits which is then used by the authority so they take the tax and they have to spend that money on buying homes from developments in order to provide affordable housing and the price they purchase it at is determined by the predicted value by the developers so it incentivizes a prediction of the true development value um, by the developer because if you if you pitch it too highly then you're paying too much tax and if you pitch it too low then the council can buy homes um, for below market value and reduce the developer's profit so there's a there's a kind of an inbuilt incentive okay and is that a solution that you agree has potential to work i i think i agree 100 percent with them that there is um there is a risk as to this vicious cycle i think the vicious cycle um, is a real thing which does happen. Um, low affordable housing predictions driving up land value, which in turn justifies low affordable housing provision. I think that genuinely does happen. But in my view, the solution is a much more straightforward one. Um, and it's a solution which actually is already found in the PPG. If you go to the PPG section on viability and look at paragraph 16, um, and if you also look at the Parkhurst Road High Court decision, this has been picked up by Mr. Justice Holgate. The solution is much simpler than what these authors are suggesting, which is to require viability assessments to calculate land value based on full compliance with planning policy on developer contributions. Because once you do this, it breaks the, the vicious circle. And I also have a problem with the idea of elevating affordable housing to something that is fixed and thereby somehow ring fenced or insulated from appraisal in terms of viability because if you've got a borderline viable scheme then the squeeze is simply just going to be felt somewhere else so you're going to have a reduced open space provision or a reduced education contribution or reduced healthcare facilities and i don't see any particular reason politically speaking why affordable housing should be prioritised over and above the other contributions that a development is expected to make. Okay, thank you very much. And finally, um, Killian, you're going to deal with uh, Warwick Lightfoot's contribution, the planning system, a supply side structural reform neglected too long. And uh, Mr. Lightfoot thinks that the planning system is egregious. Uh, Killian, do you agree? Uh, yes, well, his, uh, he's essentially an economist. And his essay reflects that as he's looking through the development industry very much as a mechanism to derive 
significant economic benefits. His cent central thesis is that the Town and Country Planning Act from 1947 was a socialist mistake that has never been rectified. And consequently, he says that we've been left with a planning system that is seriously flawed and is holding back economic gains. Um, in terms of you know, what is his proposed solution, well, what's funny about his solution is I'm not quite sure what it is because he says things like um, the, the system needs to be easier and less complex. And that is an uncontroversial statement, but it's a statement that could be said about any system that has ever existed. I can't imagine anyone advocating for a more complex and harder system. So it, it, it doesn't really tell us anything. He then yeah. says that the system should be informed by the principle that a landowner should be free to build or change the use of a building without looking at development plans, inspector's decisions, case law, and, uh, the, and a framework, framework. My problem is I don't really confess, I, don't conf I confess I don't understand what he means by that. He's saying you shouldn't really have to look at anything. Is he simply saying you can be able to do whatever you want with your land? Um, because yeah. that is quite radical and doesn't provide any balance to all the issues that arise in any given development. Yeah. He also says that there's a mistaken belief that planning is key to an attractive and aesthetically pleasing built environment. He's, as he says that some of the worst development has taken place since the Town and Country Planning Act. Yeah, so essentially um, this, there's a problem with the system but no suggestions for reform or how that might be remedied. Correct, um, and, and that, that's one of my problems with this attitude of let's just tear up the system and start again. Um, it sounds good and it, you, know, you don't have to look far to find things to be critical about in the planning system. But inevitably, when any time the government have gone about tearing it up and changing it, we're the ones who benefit. You know, any time anyone says that we're going to make the MPPF simpler, we all as barristers, we're the ones who benefit because inevitably they don't make it any more simpler. In fact, they do the opposite and they make it more complex and, and they don't plug the gaps and the, in that uncertainty. So is the planning system right for reform? Yes, obviously yes. But should that reform take this radical approach that's being advocated by the likes of Warwick Lightfoot? My, my fear is it would create more harm than good. Okay, thank you, Killian. So I'm just gonna go around the panelists quickly uh, and ask this one short question. How likely do you think it is that we're going to see radical reform to the planning system in the very near future, Ashley? Um, I think there'll be reform and I think there may well be some uh, development zones where there's fewer or maybe very very minimal planning requirements and they may coincide with the new free ports for example to to promote trade post our, the end of our transition period at the end of this year with the European Union but the, the premise that we would transmit to a, a completely zonal system I, I think is unlikely frankly because there isn't there isn't the money to allow that to happen. And uh, it's not gonna come from developers. I mean, they would say they're squeezed enough already. It's not gonna come from central government. So who is gonna be doing this system of zoning, um, certainly in the short term? So uh, I think wholesale reform is unlikely and I think would not be a sensible step, but I think there will be some uh, sensible things that could come forward to stimulate economic growth in the short term. Laura, you, you next if you wouldn't. We've had an, a, an anonymous question come in um, which asks us whether we think it's likely that the decision uh, making will be taken out of the hands of local councillors. Is that a reform we're likely to see? Well, I mean that's, um, that's something I, that I understand would come with the zoning, certainly obviously after you've done your, your plan making. Um, Again, I mean, we were talking about this yesterday. I said that I would buy everyone a drink if this sort of radical zoning came in. I then woke up to the headline that Dominic Cummings wants to take an axe to the planning system. And I felt rather less sure about myself. Gin and um, tonic, please, Tora. Sorry? Can I have a gin and tonic, please? <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see, we'll see. I, um, uh, I, I can't see decisions being taken away from councillors under this complexion of government because uh, I'm just thinking of, of the votes that the Tories rely on to get them back into government. You know, yeah. Planning is a political issue. It is going to be high on the agenda for voters. Yeah. Uh, okay, the next election is quite far away. Um, I, 
yeah, I, I, I can't see it at the moment. I don't think the culture's quite right for that to happen. Matthew, we're going to see something radical. Well, I, I really think that my, my actual, um, the one I was looking at about affordable housing, it might actually happen because it's, it's sort of beguilingly simple, their proposal, whereas all the other suggestions and all the other papers are quite complicated actually and throw up all sorts of different issues. Whereas ours, the one I was looking at, it could just be done. It could be done pretty quickly. Um, and so I think there's a real chance it might actually happen. <laughs> and Killian, finally you. You had told me a couple of years ago that um, we were leaving the European Union, Donald Trump was going to be president, and uh, we were all going to spend uh, you know, about six months of a year locked in. I'd say you were crazy, so I have stopped <laughs> trying to make predictions about what is going to happen in the world. Um, <laughs> that's one of the things I like about the job, that you know, it's constantly changing, so we, we will see. Yeah, good. Okay, well, Thank you um, very much, everyone who tuned in to listen today. Um, Tora is going to be hosting the show next week. And our hot topic is just how tilted is the tilted balance. So we look forward to seeing you then. Look out for the details um, published uh, on our LinkedIn pages and through our various chambers. And from Team Shorts, thank you very much and have a lovely evening. Yeah.